Let's talk web application architecture. More specifically, how I am going to be architecting my side project about meal planning. In today's video, I'm going to be going over the system level design, MVP architecture and enterprise architecture solution for my application and showcasing some of the thinking behind each of those. When I first started building websites and web applications, I didn't really think about the underlying architecture. And at the time, the serverless paradigm was not really known as much as it is now. All I needed then was just have a hosting, have a domain, connect all of those together and host my website like that, which basically is the monolith architecture pattern for web applications. As I was going through my career and I started working on web applications that had a lot of visitors, I had a need to learn cloud computing and how to service all of those users. And that's when I started working with AWS and containers. And again, as I shifted throughout my career, I switched to working with serverless architecture and more specifically the microservices pattern. And I'm probably going to be making a video about architecture separately so I can go into each of these in more detail. But for now, I'm just going to go over the few that I mentioned. So the first one is monolithic architecture pattern, which means all of the code, all of the logic, everything is bundled together and hosted on in one place. And then we have the microservices architecture, which is dividing the services into microservices and having them individual so they can be a standalone service, which divides the responsibilities, decouples a lot of the stuff. A lot of the big companies use this like Google and Instagram and um, YouTube. And the other buzzword nowadays is serverless, which basically is using services from the big hosting companies or whatever that you don't have to manage. So AWS provides AWS Lambdas, Azure has Azure Functions, I think, Firebase has Cloud Functions, and each of these are basically executing your code, but you don't have to manage any servers or you don't have to worry about the capacity of the servers or anything like that. You just define your functions and they execute your code. And now a quick context on my side project. So I'm going to be building a web application about meal planning. Basically, I want to plan my meals, have all the ingredients inside, and each of the ingredients will have macros and stuff like that. I want to plan my week with these meals and I can extract a list of groceries that I can tick off when I buy for the following week or something like that. And to simple that for now, but it still requires some thinking about the architecture and stuff like that. All right, we're all caught up. So let's dive into the first, which is the system level design. I think this is a great place to start thinking about architecture for any application. Basically, at the moment, I don't really have all the details for each of the requirements. I know that I want to have meals, ingredients, and weekly plan, and I want to get a grocery list, and I want to have crowd operations probably for each of those entities. Let's go and look at my system overview. So basically, this is how I envision this to work. This is basically putting what I had in my mind onto a diagram so I can kind of explain what, what is supposed to happen. So I'm going to have a client which basically holds the front-end stuff. This can be React or Next.js or anything really that can um, be loaded, that can be opened from a client. And the client will be making a request to the API and this is basically all the backend logic where it's going to live. And the API will need to authenticate the user that's making the request and it will have a database which will integrate with to, to store all the data we want for the meals, ingredients and weekly plan. And that's it from the big level overview of the system that I'm going to be building. And now let's go into the finer detail of the architecture. This resembles the system overview like I showed before, but now we have all the, the different services in here and I've used AWS services here because that's what I have experience with, but the other companies probably have the same services that you can use or alternatives for those services. So we have the user here, which will be visiting our website. The website will be mealplan.com or whatever. And this is basically the front end. The front end has an API gateway, which is the gateway to our application. And it's going to have the domain. And this is an S3 bucket, which is going to be hosting all of the front end assets, like the compiled JavaScript, the CSS and HTML, everything is going to live in this S3 bucket and the API gateway is just going to serve that to the user. From here, the front end will make a request to the back end and the back end is just a simple API with an API gateway at the front. We have a Lambda here, which is going to be a GraphQL server. That's how I envisioned it. 
and for authentication i'm going to be using a third party system which is clerk i think basically i chose this because it has a free tier when a request comes into the backend this will first authenticate the user and if it's a valid user it's going to continue doing the operation and a graphql server will have all the queries and mutations for each of the CRUD operations that I want for all the entities and a database, which I haven't really defined what kind of database I'm going to be using here. It's probably going to be a Postgres database. Yeah, the GraphQL will integrate with this database to get and to, to store the data and to get the data from. And in terms of the patterns here, this is basically a serverless monolith. All of the business logic and all of the backend logic is going to live in this Lambda basically. And the front end is in this home bucket so it doesn't really decouple much but for starting i think this is a good starting point using the serverless technology we have right now and not really care about maintaining our servers and stuff like that the main reason i'm using lambdas here and serverless is because they are very cheap especially if you don't have a lot of users the way that lambda pricing works is they charge you for the time of the execution and how many times it was invoked. So if I have one user and this is only invoked like 15 times a day, then I'm not gonna be charged a lot. But if I have a whole container reserved just for my application, this is gonna be running whether or not I have users. Let's move on to how I would architect this if this grew into a big enterprise application. Now I don't vision this to grow into something like that. The whole idea behind the project is just I want to solve my own problem and then see if I can make it into something bigger, like a SaaS or something like that. So this is where it gets a little bit more complicated. There's not 100% detail on this, but it's just a way to showcase how I would think about the architecture diagram. This is basically the starting point, but you don't really start with this. Usually you start with something small like the MVP architecture and then you grow from there as your requirements and user bases grow. The reason I wanted to showcase this is to showcase some of the thinking that goes behind architecting a big application like that. For example, if the MVP application started to have millions and millions of users daily, that will require a better architecture to serve all of those requests. So this can be a bit overwhelming, but if we start step by step and let's look at the front end first. The front end will use CrowdFront to cache the static assets. This is an AWS service that is basically a CDN, um, a content delivery network that provides caching and it, you can distribute your application globally um, and the users can access it very fast. So when the user hits, our website is gonna get all the stuff from CrowdFront. And then for the actual code on the front end, I've decided I'm gonna use micro front ends. And again, I'm not really gonna go too deep into this. It deserves a separate video where I can really go into more detail about micro frontends. But basically what micro frontends is, is dividing the responsibilities on the front end. And the way that these work is you have an aggregator which aggregates all the different micro frontends. In this example, I have two, which is the meals micro frontend and the ingredients micro frontend. The meals micro front end is only going to care about the meals and everything related to the meals like create a new meal update the meal and stuff like that and it doesn't really it, it's not going to know about the ingredients or how to create an ingredient and all the different stuff around ingredients macros and stuff like that the ingredients micro front end is only going to care about the ingredients so this basically separates the responsibilities of the two micro front ends and if this is a big enterprise application and you have a lot of resources each of these can have a separate team working on them. And let's look at the backend. So in the backend, we can divide the backend kind of two parts. We have a GraphQL kind of um, microservice, and then we have two separate microservices for the meals and ingredients. The reason I put the GraphQL here is I want the front end to only hit one API for all the operations. I don't want it to know that there's multiple microservices behind that GraphQL server. And this also allows for a central place to authenticate the user and then forward the request to the, the individual microservices. One of the downsides for this is this can grow a lot bigger. So all of the queries and mutations are gonna be here, but they're not actually gonna make any operations and um, update the database. They will only forward the request to the microservices. And that means having this Lambda running while it makes requests to different Lambda, which is not ideal. 
And again, when I when if I'm actually implementing this and maybe the, the shortcomings are actually bigger than I think at the moment, this can be changed as well. So then we have the two microservices. So these again have an, each of them have an API gateway at the front, which is basically where the request goes first. And then API gateway invokes each of the lambdas. And each of the lambdas now have a much granular responsibilities. So for example, this lambda will have only responsibility to get the meals from the database and return them back to the user. So it doesn't really do much outside of that. And you can add different logic in here, like transform, transform the objects and any kind of different logic. I haven't really put all the CRUD operations here, but this is just an example. The update meal lambda can have the logic around validating the input. Any business rules we have for updating a meal can live in here and it's gonna integrate with the database. And if this is a big enterprise application, I'm probably gonna go with DynamoDB because it provides a lot more faster um, reads and writes than an RDS database. And because these are gonna be divided in microservices, they're gonna be much smaller and easier to work with. And again, for the, the ingredients microservice is basically identical, but it has, um, it only cares about the ingredient. It's gonna have its own separate database to store the ingredients data. And again, this is not really detailed still that because this is still just an idea. If I'm going down the path of implementing actually all of this, I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of quirks and stuff that I haven't really thought about yet, but I just want to give an idea of when the application grows, when the requirements grow, then your architecture needs to follow all of that to service everything that the application needs. And ideally you would do this with the best performance and most cost effective way. And if the application grows in the future, we can add different microservices here. And if everything is set up correctly, this can be very easy to do. If I want to build a pantry, for example, to track the ingredients you have in a pantry, that's gonna be a separate microservice. I can go on and on about microservices and uh, this architecture pattern, but I hope this gives enough context of why I've made some of the decisions I've made and why big applications go down the microservices route. The most important thing about small project is to get it up, get it running and start to get users and get feedback from the users. And then as it grows, if it grows, hopefully, then you can think about how to make it better and improve it. But having an idea of all the different patterns and ways that you can architect your application will help with providing the best solution. All of that being said, I will most likely go down the Indie Hackers route and just use Next.js and Vercel to get my application up and running. And it's still gonna use serverless architecture, but I'm not really gonna care about what's behind it. In either way, I really wanted to showcase how I would architect an application if I had to, and some of the reasons behind why and how all of that's gonna happen. I will be making new videos around this project and how I get on with it and Next.js and Vercel and stuff like that. So make sure to subscribe to not miss those. But for now, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you very much for watching. If you have any feedback, put down the comments below. I go through all the comments in my videos. And as always, enjoy the rest of your day. Happy coding. Bye.